Chapter 1. In this chapter you will learn about simple electrical networks, about electrical resistance, about voltage, potential and current. So if you already know these topics, you can skip this chapter. We will also look at the simple infinite network. You will learn about superposition and at the end we will cover the infinite network of 1 ohm resistors for the case of two nearby nodes. What drives electricity? Let's assume we have a battery with 12 volts. So one of the connectors is at 0 volts and the other is at 12 volts. We say that the electric potential of the one connector is 0 volts and that of the other connector is 12 volts. Let's assume the two connectors are 20 millimeters apart. Then between these poles we have an electric field. Roughly the field is the difference in potential. This is 12 volts divided by the distance. This is 20 millimeters. So we end up with an electric field that is on average 600 volts per meter. So in our case the electric field will not be homogeneous, so it will vary between the two poles, but on average we will have a field of 600 volts per meter. If an electric charge is placed in between the poles, the electric field will apply a force on this charge. The force is proportional to the electric field and of course to the amount of charge in the test charge. If our test charge happens to be an electron, this electron has a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 ampere seconds. As the charge is negative, the resulting force will also go into the other direction. In everyday life we are not so much concerned with electrical force, but we usually talk about electric potential and voltage. So for example we might want to check the voltage of our car battery and use a pocket multimeter to check this voltage. We connect the black cable to the minus pole and the red cable to the plus pole and then our multimeter shows a voltage of 12 volts. If we would have connected the cables the other way, so the red cable to the minus pole and the black cable to the plus pole, we would see a voltage of minus 12 volts. So our multimeter only ever measures the difference in the potentials of two connections. If the voltage on the red cable is higher than that of on the blue cable, we see a positive voltage. If the potential on the red cable is lower than that on the, on the black cable, then we see a negative voltage. In the air between the two poles there aren't many charges so there will be no electric current unless the voltage would be very high and then we would get an electric spark. But in the cable that connects our multimeter to the poles of the battery these cables are made of metal and metal are good conductors. So the electric field will move the charges, the electrons inside the wire and will move them in a way so that the electric field within the wire is zero. Because we only ever measure the difference between the potential of two connections, we can arbitrarily define one connection to be zero volts. Usually this connection that is defined as being zero volt is called the ground and marked with a special ground symbol. Sometimes this ground is literally connected to the ground outside of your house. Let's say we have a complicated circuit and within this circuit we have three points A, B and C. On point A we have a potential of 3 volt in regards to ground. In point B we have a potential of 7 volts compared to ground and in point C we have a voltage of minus 2 volts compared to ground. We can measure these voltages with our multimeter again. 
On point B we measure 7 volts. We can also verify that the potential on point B is 4 volts higher than that on point A. So 7 minus 3 is 4. We indicate this by drawing these arrows from the higher potential to the lower potential and then denoting the voltage between the two points. So here we have a voltage of UBE of 4 volts. Between B and C we have 7 minus minus 2 gives 9 volts. And finally between point A and point C we measure a voltage of 3 minus minus 2 gives 5 volts. Of course we can always change the direction of an arrow and also flip the sign of the voltage. So instead of a voltage from B to C we can measure the voltage from C to B which in our case would be minus 9 volts. So if we sum up all these voltages in a loop we have UBA plus UEC plus UCB and we get a total of zero. This is just a result of the fact that the electric field is a potential field. Each point in space can be assigned a certain potential. And this is Kirchhoff's loop rule. As a side note, this rule can be violated if we have a changing magnetic field, but that would be a video for another day. Our purpose, the electric field, is a potential field. What is a current? If we have electric wire and there's a certain amount of charged particles passing through the wire at a given time, then we have a certain current. For example, so for example, if all the charges that pass through the red line in one second sum up to one ampere second, then we have a current of one ampere. From this it should be clear that if many wires are connected in a point and there are a few wires that bring some current in and a few wires where current is flowing away, then the sum of the currents that are flowing in must be equal to the sum of the current flowing outwards. Otherwise there would be some charge that accumulates in the center. This is Kirchhoff's current law. If we would label all currents, for example, as outgoing from the connection, then this would mean that some of the currents would have a negative sign. When charges are flowing through a material, that is an electric current is flowing, so this is usually not without resistance. Sometimes these charges pump into electrons and lose some energy. So here we have an electric resistance. In order to have more current flowing we need a higher voltage. So the voltage is proportional to the current. If you have a resistor usually you can read its resistance from its color coded label. Or you take out your multimeter and switch it to measuring of resistance and then you can simply measure the resistance with your multimeter. In our case, our multimeter says this resistor has a resistance of 150 ohms. If, for example, we would apply a voltage of 30 volts to this resistor, then we will get a current of 30 volts divided by 150 ohms, which would give us 0.2 amperes. So this is Ohm's law. I is U divided by R, so current is voltage divided by resistance, or resistance is the ratio between voltage and current, or the voltage is always the current times the resistance. What if we connect two resistors together? We connect them in series, we connect them back to back. Let's say the first resistor has a resistance of R1 is 100 ohms and the second one has a resistance R2 of 200 ohms. From Kirchhoff's first law we know that the current that goes through both resistors is the same. 
we call it i and it's the same i1 and i2. We also know that the voltages will add up. So the total voltage is the voltage of u1 plus the voltage around the resistor 2, u2. From this it's easy to see that the total resistance is the sum of the two individual resistance. In our case it would be 100 plus 200 giving 300 ohms. What if we want to connect two resistors in parallel? This time the incoming current will be split up and one part will flow through the resistor R1 and the other part will flow through the resistor R2. But the voltage that is on each resistor is the same. U is the total voltage and it's also the same on U1 and the same on resistor 2. So here it's easy to find that the total resistance 1 over R is the sum of 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. This is because the current is proportional to 1 over R. Equipped with this knowledge, we can simplify a complicated network of resistors. For example, in this case, we could combine the resistors R3 and R4 on the lower right side to one combined resistor that we label R3, 4. And this is just the sum of the two individual resistors. From here on, we connect the resistor R2 that is in parallel to the sum of R3 and R4 and we label the resulting resistor R234. And then the total resistor is just the sum of R234 and R1. So once more, first we combined the resistors R3 and R4 to give us R34. Then we combine it with R2 to give us R234. And then once again we combine it with R1 to give our total resistance. Unfortunately, it's not always this simple. Not all networks of resistors can be simplified by using parallel and serial connections of simple resistors, for example in this case. In some cases we could use some symmetry. For example, in this case if all resistors would be the same, or at least if the ratio of R1 and R2 is the same as R3 and R4, then the voltage between the points P and E would be zero. And if the voltage between the points P and E is zero, then there is no current flowing through resistor R5. If there is no current through the resistor R5, then we can also remove it from the circuit without changing anything. And then computing the total resistance is rather simple here. Of course, this only works in cases where we have some symmetry. If we have arbitrary resistors R1, R2, R3 and R4, then this method will not work. In such a case, one method that would help here is the so-called star triangle substitution. If we have a resistance between three points and we have three resistors connected in the form of a star, we can replace them with three resistors connected in the form of a triangle. This is always possible and the formulas for calculating the equivalent resistor are rather simple. So I will not go into detail here, but you can look it up on, on Wikipedia. So this would actually help in our situation here and with the star triangle transformation the network is easy to solve. As a last resort, we can always fall back to creating a system of equations. With Kirchhoff's law and Ohm's law, we can create a system of equations, substitute one current for another, one voltage for another, and then gradually simplify the system of equations and so solve the equations. 
So this is always po possible, but sometimes it's a little bit more work. So people usually prefer the previous methods. So with all what we have learned now, let's look at an infinite network. An infinite network of one ohm resistors, but the much simpler one than that we originally had. What is the total resistance that we measure between points 1 and 2 in the network below? Pause the video if you want to try it yourself. It's not that hard. Okay, so here's the solution. Let's say the resistance that we measure between points 1 and 2 is R. Then if we cut along the red line, the resistance that we measure between the points there must also be R, because it must not change if we remove the first few resistors, since the network is infinitely long anyways. So this means we can replace the whole network after the red line with, with a resistor that we also label R. So then the remaining calculation is really simple. We have R in parallel with the 1 ohm resistor giving us 1 over 1 plus 1 over R as a total resistor and then 1 ohm in series. So we have R is 1 plus R over R plus 1 and this gives us the quadratic equation R squared minus R minus 1 is 0. This equation has two solutions. R is 1 half plus minus square root of 5 divided by 2. Since one of these solutions is negative, it makes sense to only take this positive solution because our resistance will certainly be positive. So get the solution R is 1 half plus square root of 5 divided by 2. This is roughly 1.618033 and this is also known as the golden ratio. Please note that now our resistance is not a rational number. So it's not a ratio of two whole numbers. While normally when we connect together resistance we always get rational numbers of the original resistors. In this case because we connect infinitely many, we get a square root. So there's one more thing that we need to learn before we can look at our infinite network of 1 ohm resistors. And this is the so-called superposition principle. Let's assume we have a complicated network of resistors. So these resistors are in a black box. Let's say there is one resistor called R417 and this resistor is visible from the outside and so we can measure the voltage across this resistor. We will measure the voltage across this resistor with our multimeter. The black box also has three pairs of connectors which are supposed to receive power from external power supply supplies like battery and current sources. We have a 5 volt battery, an 8 volt battery and a 0 0.5 ampere current source. So a battery always supplies the same voltage and the current source always supplies the same current. So now we connect our current sources through the three input terminals on our black box. We connect the 5 volt, the 8 volt and the 0 0.5 amps power supply. And then when we measure on our output resistor R417, so we measure a voltage of 21 volts. Now to verify our measurement, we disconnect the power supplies. We replace the power supplies with a short circuit. A short circuit is like a power supply that always supplies exactly zero volts because it's a short circuit. In order to ensure that no current is flowing from our current source, we simply can disconnect the current source. 
Not very surprisingly, we measure an output voltage of 0 volts. Now let's see what happens when we individually connect each of the power supplies separately. We start with our power supply U1 and only connect our 5 volt battery to the first input. This time we measure an output voltage of 2 volts. So our hidden black box network is like an unknown function that computes an output depending on the inputs. It's the function F. Now let's only connect the power supply 2. Again we replace our power supply 1 with a short, short circuit to ensure the voltage there is exactly 0 volts and we have not connected our current source. This time we measure an output voltage of 6 volts. So the last measurements we do is we only connect our power source E3 which supplies a current of 0 0.5 amperes. Again we replace the power supplies of the batteries with a short circuit to ensure that the voltage there is exactly 0 volts. Our measurement of the output voltage is now 13 volts. So this is the superposition principle. The total output voltage by all three power sources together is the sum of each of the individuals. So the 2 volts we got in the first experiment and the 6 volts we got in the second and the 13 volts we got in the third case add up to 21 volts, which is what we measured when we had all three power sources connected. This is the superposition principle. It's rather simple. It just says that our network is a linear network, that our function is a linear function. In order to once again verify that our network is linear, we double the power source E3, we replace the half amp current with a 1 amp current, and we observe that the output voltage also doubles from 13 volt to 26 volts. So equipped with this knowledge, we can look at a very simple case for our infinite network of 1 ohm resistors. In our network, we have the center point A and we have another point above, we label B. And now we want to send in a current of 1 ampere to point E. Now of course we cannot simply send in a current to a point, we need to connect our current source to two points. So we will take the second point at infinity. So you could imagine like having many points infinitely far away and we connect all these infinitely far away points together and this will be the place where the other end of the current source is connected. So this way we manage to send in 1 ampere to point A. So since the current that we send in also needs to go out through the four resistors and since the network is completely symmetrical in all directions, so all the currents that go out from this point E will be the same. So they all have to be 0 0.25 ampere. So this means that the voltage on the resistors near our point E will be 0 0.25 volts since they all have 1 ohm and since the current is 0 0.25 amperes also the voltage across each of these resistors that are connected to point A needs to be 0 0.25 volts. So this means that the potential difference between point E and point B will be 0 0.25 volts. Of course our point E is nothing special. So the same thing would happen if we send in the current to any other point. Always the voltage between the point where we send in the 1 ampere and the neighboring point would be 0 0.25 volts. So now let's send in a second current. 
we send in a current of minus 1 ampere and we send it in to point B. Now let's remember the superposition principle. The voltage that is generated from E2 will add up to the voltage that is generated from current I1. So the voltage over our resistor that was originally 0 0.25 volts will be now 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 or 0 0.5 volts. Remember that the current that we send in now has a negative sign, but also the direction of the errors would be would be in the other direction. So we have two minus signs and in total the contribution from I1 and I2 will add up positively to 0 0.5 volts among the resistor between A and B. Now what we can do next is replace our two current source, which both have their other terminal connected at infinity. We remove them and replace them with one current source. The one current source sends in one ampere to point A and then also draws one ampere from point B. So we no longer need to connect our current source infinitely far away. We only have one current source sending in one ampere to point A and drawing out one ampere or sending in a negative current of one ampere to point B. So basically nothing has changed. We still send in one ampere to point A and we still draw out a current of one ampere on point B. So since nothing has changed, the voltage across the resistor between E and B is sti still 0 0.5 volts and we send in a current of 1 ampere. So this means that from the, point, from the view of the current source, the total resistance between the points E and B is exactly 0 0.5 volts divided by 1 ampere or 0 0.5 ohms. Of course, if we measure the resistance with our multimeter, we still measure 0 0.5 ohms. In the end, what the multimeter does, it sends in a current and measures the voltage, and so it will measure the total resistance of 0.5 ohms. So this was rather simple, but it turns out the case where we want to measure the resistance between two diagonal points, this is much, much harder. And in order to solve this, we still need some additional tools. And we will acquire them in the next chapter. So stay tuned.